Greetings and welcome back to another episode of Heaven on Wheels. I'm joined today by Pastor Jeffrey Parker, Dr. Parker. Um, a lot of names we have, Pastor Parker. So what exactly do I call you? Oh, just Pastor Parker's fine. If you want to even say Brother Parker, I'm, I'm not held in titles. I'm the senior pastor here at, at the Church of All Faiths, but I'm, I'm not stuck on titles. I'm I'm just here to do God's will, and I, this is what I do. This is what I've been called to do. And at the end of the day, we're we're here to win souls. And it's not about our name. It's not about no titles. Take away the titles. Take away all that. We're soul winners. And, uh, you know, Jesus says he, he paid the price for us, but we are, we are to win souls for Jesus Christ. Amen. Right. So I believe the last time we spoke, you were a single man at that time. <laughs> yes, that's been over two years ago because I got married on June 19th. Juneteenth, June 19th, 2021, and I was married to the lovely Cynthia, and her name now is Cynthia Parker. Cynthia Parker. Yes, <laughs> and uh, we I, I had no intentions of getting remarried, especially when you've been married uh, to one person and four children, uh, 28 years, and just, you know, every, you know, that was the love of my life, but God called her home in 2016. 16. Yeah, in 2016, she passed away. And um, after that, I was I I was just fine pastoring, seeing about my children. And the truth was I, I, had, I was going through severe depression, severe depression. People didn't realize it. I was still pastoring, still teaching, because I teach special education for Oakland Unified School District. and uh, But it was nothing but the grace of God that healed me and delivered me out of a severe depression. It didn't start happening until around 2019, three years afterward, right before the COVID and all that. The Lord really blessed me and healed me and brought me out. You know, that's a pivot. I hadn't planned on talking about that. Yes. But since you opened that can of worms, you know, I heard someone once say you can be a public success and a private failure. Yes, yes. It uh, so depression is a real thing. I mean, it can hit politicians, it can hit pastors, oh, it can yeah. hit police, it can hit oh, parents. Yeah. Oh, um, definitely, definitely. I'm not. I don't have nothing to hide. I'm not embarrassed about. It. I hopefully it'll help someone because I was one who, um, being a pastor, who have always helped people during their crisis. But during my crisis, I really didn't have no one to turn to but God. I mean. Um, yes, when it initially happened, of course, I had family that came in, stayed with me. But after all the dust has settled, all the friends are gone, you're all alone. I yeah. think that's a Daryl Coley song. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So did they know about it? Did it, you didn't have a, do you have a best friend? Well, I had a best friend, Heather, but they didn't know how much, they didn't, they didn't know the, the severe depression I was going through. But even your family and friends, they just want you to be, okay they want you to be right so they're just trying to say anything and do anything to to make you be whole and some of the things they just really don't know what to say because you'll have people say oh just get you a young one now oh or do this but they don't really know what to say get you a uh, young one yeah talking about a young <laughs> one but they, they really don't know what to say but they didn't know the severe depression I was in. I even I kept a smile on my face, but I was suffering. I was crying inside and my attention was on the children. But every night, actually every day I left work, as uh, soon as I left at work to get in my car, once I got in my car, tears, I'd just be sobbing, crying all the way home. But I was, and I was in severe, severe depression, had no one really to to share it with or no one to counsel me with and but I yet was preaching yet witnessing yet teaching just going through the motions but what happened was my daughter um, my, my oldest child my daughter princess she came to me one day and said dad you feel like it seems like you just don't even want to live and she was right because I was at a point where oh Lord if you take me fine if I stay fine and she was right but she said we need you dad we're still here and of course, I was doing everything I could for them and uh, whatever they needed, I was getting it to them. But they said they needed me. They needed me not to not to check out. And they they, they could sense I was ready to just check out. And um, of course, I, I wouldn't I wasn't thinking about committing suicide or nothing like that. But 
my mind state was such, well, Lord, if you take me, fine. I'm, I'm good. But no, when she said that, it, it shook me. And I realized, you know, you're right. And I, at that point, I've been praying and I start getting myself together and slowly coming back. And then finally, I, well, I, I just, the Lord delivered me, he healed me. Then family member was saying, oh, we're glad to have you back now. We're glad, whatever that meant. I guess they just meant to, that they have, you know, the old Jeffrey back or something. Well, was it a constant depression where that triggers music or anniversaries? Or no, it, did, or? it didn't even have to be music or nothing. It was just the sense that she was to reality that this person that you love so much, uh, you wouldn't hear their voice no more. They wasn't there. That was your best friend to talk to. Whatever I'm going through, even with church work, I could run it by her. I had no one to run things by, no one to bounce things by, and really no one to just give you the assurance that, hey, you're okay, or I'm with you, you're doing well, or you know, you're know, you doing this. No. So that all that just sat in and um, just caused severe depression. That best friend and... Um, how did you cope? You know, some people medicate. That some people get into overworking well, yeah, or well, overdoing. Yeah, my cope. Or, yeah, my. Yeah, you're right. My coping mechanism was between work. My attention was work, children, church. But so I was here uh, at the church. That was my coping mechanism. Working in my office after I worked at at the school site. Instead of going home, I'd come here and stay here till one, maybe sometimes two in the morning, just, you know, working, doing, you know, before uh, it got so late, I'd be making calls, reading, praying, trying to work on my, my message and just, just, I, this was my safe haven. And you had kids at home at that time, right? Yeah, I had kids so at home. How did they, how did they deal with you coming in like that? Well, they not- knew, they knew I was a night owl, but they would, you know, be up for me, just make sure that I'm okay. And of course, I'd check in with them to make sure that they were fed or we would do a late night run to nations and I'd pick them up and, hey, let's go get a chocolate shake. And so, I mean, so that's the way I was coping, but, but, um, and, yes. and and how long did you say this lasted? Uh, about from two thousand three years, two thousand sixteen to at least two thousand nineteen. Then I then Lord start healing me and bringing me out because uh, you know I was still because I was still had the church to see about, um, and then uh, you know I started the project with the church of remodeling the whole church, and that that became another mechanism of help of it just gave me a whole new and then I had to really just pray and 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 um know that you know to accept I never blamed God never was mad at God but just accept what God allowed that um I'm very selfish to want her here when that's what we 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 pray for is to be with Jesus and I know she 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 made it to be with the Lord I know it without a doubt in my heart so it's selfish for me to want her here when the Lord took her on home and the way it happened I knew then that she had made it because she passed away in the hospital Kaiser Hospital emergency room and what happened was she had a massive heart attack. They were working on her. And I was right there. My daughter was there. But I believe I, it, when, it, when it was going on, so it was happening so quick and everything happening with doctors and nurses and I'm just frantic. But here's what I believe. And I heard a voice. I heard a voice in there with all the chaos saying that the Lord asked her, do you want to go back? And when she said, uh, will he be all right? Referring to me, will will because she was just concerned about me. My wife was. She says, "Will he be all right?" Talking about, will my husband be all right? And the voice said, "He'll be fine." Once she heard that, boom, it was over. So you heard this? This was in the hospital. In the hospital, in the emergency room, when all that was happening. You weren't asleep. This no, was- no, I was up in the in the. You got to remember, it was a middle of chaos that. You had, when I say cost, you had doctors all around her working on her, nurses, and they're trying to, you know, bring her to, and then they're keep, then they had me out of the room, and I'm, and I'm just crying and screaming, trying to see what's going on. One doctor came by and said, "Oh, she's gonna be all right. There, she's, you know, they're working on her." So I'm thinking, "Oh, okay, she's gonna come too. They've got her out." Then 
you know, it's just a, a touch and go. And then finally, like I said, I heard, it's like I heard during that time, this is what I heard in my voice. Now, keep in mind, before this happened, a week before this happened, the Lord already showed me this, this same incident in a dream. And I woke up and I was just like, oh my goodness. But I woke up before I knew the outcome. And my wife turned to me and says, what happened? What happened? Did I die? I said, oh, no, no. And I'm like, I'm rebuking the dose. I said, the blood of Jesus. And I didn't even tell her what happened. I just said, oh, no, no. It's just it's just the devil. The blood I, of Jesus. I wonder what made her come up with that outcome. She just said it. She just said, Did, am, am I? Because may, maybe the way I woke up in such a frantic, I woke up in a frantic, like, whoa, because it, it was like, it was so real and of, of what was happening. And then not to know a week later, it happened exactly the way my dream was. Well, Amos 3, 7 says God does nothing without revealing it yeah, to his prophets. That's an interesting. And, and at the time, and at the time it was happening, I didn't even reflect back on that dream. Otherwise, I don't know what I would have done, but it happened exactly the way it was in the dream. But in the dream, I woke up before I knew the outcome. In real life, real time, we got the outcome. And so he was preparing you in a sense, you believe? I believe he did. He was preparing me. He, gave, he was giving me a warning. He was giving me a heads up. But somehow he must have been dealing with my wife because she she was already ready. It was just, it seemed like she was already ready, but she was just concerned about us or concerned about myself. And then after it happened, the, the, the night it happened, my daughter had a dream. My, my wife came to her and says, I'm doing fine. Uh, I've been in this long line. It's just a long line that I'm in, but I'm fine. And just take care of your dad. And this was after she passed? Yeah, after she passed. The same night after when we went home, she had that dream. And that was just like the worst where to go home. And, and, and in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, this is just, it's just a nightmare. I was, even when I went home, I was praying that they were going to call me from the hospital say come back your wife's okay but you know and you, and you had to share this with the kids and yeah man well the kids were there they i had to take them home because they had came to the hospital except for jeffrey the next morning i had to pick him up from the airport because he was out of town so he flew in i got him a flight he had where he had to you know take a red eye or something and he flew in so the next morning i had to pick him up so it was just it was just a whole tragic thing and then from there you realize reality sets in because I'm thinking that night, oh, we're going to snap out. They're going to call me. She's She woke up or they got her out and she made it and, and I come back and pick her up. That's what I was praying and hoping, but it didn't happen. And I was just like, well, this this is, it really starts sinking in. But what else sunk in was depression. Just It was just like all my attention went from whatever I was doing, church, teaching to the children you know that's where my mind reflected to the children the depression almost seems like they call um high blood pressure the silent killer yeah because you say 2016 uh -huh. and you and i spent time during that period yeah. yeah you know you you had a good face yeah i mean i would have never known right what you were going through. i was you're right and i was so going through how, it. how do you deal with with depression and people that have these experiences because I would have never known what you were going through when you and I were interacting. I believe yeah. I came to some church yeah, you services did, you did. and um, you did. we did some other things. And what do you kind of say to that? Well, it's it's God helping you through it, and you're 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 trying to really hold yourself up to, together. So you you yeah you have a your face you you're being who you are, but like you said internally. It, it, it's a battle, so and, and you're, you're you're doing everything in the will of God to to because it is a spiritual battle. Because remember, the Satan he's trying to take you out, so then it becomes a spiritual battle where the Holy Spirit is helping you maintain. So that's so that's why I was able to talk to you and say, "Hey, brother Keith, how you doing?" And come over, you know, you came, we talked, and everything. I'm because I'm just trying to to maintain my sanity really but i guess i'm trying to figure out how we help people because we see 
uh, especially young people or people yeah. of all ages slipping away right. and you find out that they were dealing with depression. We yeah. even we even find the people that have mental uh, illness yeah. who get yeah. involved in the, the school shootings and mall shootings, and no. but you don't see it. No, so, what, no, but what we have to do is we don't see it per se, but we have to really be uh, more tenacious in, in in our dealings with people to... to to be on, say, Brother Keith, how are you doing? I want to make sure you're okay. And, and really give people a safe place uh, to, to express themselves, themselves and, and that, that they are where, they can, where they'll be comfortable to talk about it. I guess it could be a cliche when we say, you know, how are you doing today, brother? A lot of times we really... Yeah, we say fine, but they're not. Yeah, but a lot of times we ask and we really don't want the answer. It's just yeah, a cliche. Yeah. Well, yeah, and we have to be prepared to say, um, to to break that wall down that it's okay if you're not okay. We have to let people know, no, it's all right if you're not feeling okay. It's all right to say, especially in the church culture, they'll they'll just, oh, just pray about it. And they and the church culture does damage because we'll uh, instantly judge people like, oh, well, they're not really saved. They haven't been praying if they're depressed. No, that's the wrong attitude. People are going through because we're in a warfare and we have to make people feel comfortable enough to say, oh, Brother Keith, I'm not doing well today. I need to talk to you. Can we go have coffee? I'm really depressed about, I've just been thinking about my, my, my wife and I just want someone to talk to. Now, people have to get to that point where they're safe, where you would say, yo, yes, Pastor, let's, let's go. See, they have to be comfortable to give people that comfortable space. I guess we also have to have something that's available to help people. Yes. Because we I, do. I believe you told me you have a sister when you were going through the situation yeah. and she approached you. Well, and what what my sister did was was just phenomenal when I when my wife first passed away. Not only did she fly in to see about me, but she stayed with me for 2 weeks. So that helped. You know, she could that's the longest she could stay because she had to get back home to her family and all that. But at least she came in for two weeks. But what I'm saying is after all that, you still are human and you know, after two weeks and after especially after the uh the 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 home going, there you have a big crowd and people concerned, but then after all that, you don't see nobody. It all goes away. Oh, it just fades away. They're they're gone. They're gone. You know, you may get a call, you may not. But after that home going service, they're good. You don't see them. You know, of course, my family are going to, you know, call and check on them. I'm just talking about the other church people. Um, but pastors specifically need a, a mechanism that when, especially a loved one passes away, they, that's why you can't be an island. You need a covering. You need other pastors who will come and be with you. They don't, it's not what they say, just to sit with you. You know, right, they, don't, right. they don't have to talk. They call that the, the, the wounded healer, um, Henry Nguyen. Just, he has a whole book on it. Just, just to sit with people. You don't have to, it's not what you say, but just to be there in case they want to say something. But, and, and it's good to just let them know I'm here for you. And what was it like, the transition when you were ready to date again or love yeah. again or marry? Right. What, the, you know, well, that, yeah, that came about, like I said, I wasn't really planning on it. Not that I had people who came, young ladies, or not just women, they came, and I thought them taking me, they, just, they wanted to take me out to dinner. I thought it was a gesture to say, hey, I'm your friend. But no, their gesture was, hey, was it, you know, they're in their mind. They wanted to be a first lady. And that, that my mind wasn't there. One lady, well, you know, I, you know, that's a high value. Pastors, yeah. Are. yeah. Well, but one said, uh, bef I, I didn't even minister. She says, um, "Would I have to go to church every Sunday?" And I'm like, I said, I said, check, please. Can you give me the check? Uh, I'm ready to go. Give Re me the check. Ready to go. I'm huh? ready to go. Because <laughs> no one even mentioned it to her, you know. But that's where their mindset is. But no, the way this came about um, in, two, in 2021, I was minding my business. My friend, I mean, uh, Pastor Clifton, said, oh, Jeffrey, you know, he, they were trying to get me just to 
go have lunch with someone or that. So I said, okay, I'm trying, but you know, so and and you had got you had gotten past what you would say was your depression period. Yeah, well, yeah, I was, I was, yeah, I was, I was through with the depression, so I was ready. But at that time, I was doing ministry, remodeling the church, so I had a lot going on. But I was willing to, oh yeah, what's a, a dinner is going to be fine with someone. So I did go uh, to dinner with a few people, and then um, he had this young lady call me. Uh, he put put me on a three way on February, yeah, February the nineteenth. It was late at night. It was well, like you remember the date yeah, that it was, had it an was, impact yeah, on yeah, you. Yeah, it was like at ten ten thirty at night. He calls. He says, "Oh, um, Pastor Parker, I have." He let me know. I have um, uh, Sister Cynthia on the line. I wanted you to talk to her. I just wanted to see if you guys could, you know, go have coffee or dinner. So, and so she was on the line. I said, oh, sure. But he said, well, uh, we're going to hang up. Uh, you guys hang up and you can call her back. You know where he's not online, so I did. I called her back. She gave me the number. I called back. I said, "Oh, well, how are you doing? God bless you." I'm, I'm, you know, Pastor Parker, and she gave me a name. I said, "Yeah, I, I would love to go out and have um, lunch or dinner." And this was a Friday night. I said, "Well, okay, why don't we go okay. have lunch?" And she said, "Oh, yeah, sure." I said, "Well, um, could you come by my church? And you can come to my church, and then we'll figure out where to go." Okay, and okay. that's what we did. And, it, and so was that a safe place for you or a safe place? Yeah. For safe, well, yeah, I wanted to come and, 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 and meet me at the church. Cause I'm, I was at the office all the time anyway. Okay. So this would be a place, easy place for her to find where I, you know, so she came to the church and, um, I went outside to greet her and you know, she, she came in and, um, I said, well, God bless you. And, you know, gave her, a, you know, a handshake, walked her in and, and then, um, we sat in my office, not with the office I have now, my little small office, and and I said, well, well, let me show you around. I showed her the church, and and you know she really liked it and everything, and and I said, well, let's let's go out, um, let's go have lunch. I said, what do you like? And I said, well, we can we can go somewhere close. So we end up going here to Lake Chalette here, right? okay, real close by, right, right over. Nice yeah, and then, then the rest was history. You know, we we had lunch on that Saturday, which was Saturday, and then. Uh, Lo and behold, her church is only, what, less than 10 minutes away, right here on 24th. It's real close by, less than five minutes away. Right? She goes, she was going to Queen Memorial off of 24th there. Small world. And, um, but what's even more shocking with this whole story, come to find out her daughter and my son Joshua were in the same class together at Patton. That's crazy. And there's no, well, I mean, I would go up to Patton some, you know, sometimes, but most of the time my wife and my daughter would be up there. But I'm, I, my, and we did, I mean, low, we, we had to cross paths. But of course, she was married, I'm married at the time, so of course we're not looking, but we had to cross paths because our kids were in the same class. And as soon as her daughter, what well, she mentioned to her daughter, her daughter's name, Nia, about, oh, do you know a Joshua? And she said, yes, he was in my class. And then, <laughs> just, so it was just crazy. Yeah, That's so, crazy. Yeah, just, that was crazy. The, the timing wasn't right. Yeah, the, well, and, well, and then I knew something was different about this situation because my wife passed away in 2016 in um, October. Her husband passed away in 2016 in August. <laughs> and they both passed away of the same thing, a heart attack. Oh, man. Isn't that something? Now, now tell me if that's not our own. That's something. That's the, so her husband passed away of a heart attack in August uh, and, and, and at Kaiser in Richmond. My wife passed away in of October. a heart attack in October, wow. Kaiser in Oakland. Mm. And so she had went through and I had went through, and that's 2016, here comes now, fast forward to 2021, and we we meet up. And so we met at Lake Chalet that Saturday. Then we went to dinner Sunday after church. Of course, she went to church. I was here. We met up after church, went to the Cheesecake Factory in Walnut Creek there. One of my favorite spots. Yeah. And then the rest is history. We um, 
How long was the courtship? 120 days, exactly. <laughs> February 19th, we met. We were married on June 19th. 120 days. This seems planned almost. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> 120 days, exactly. Four months, exactly. And we got married in Las Vegas. That seems planned. It was, no, Sin City, it, huh? It, yeah, it was, yeah, we went to Vegas and had a blast. People flew in. You know, she had 30 guests. I had 30 guests. Everything was just laid out for us. You know, we didn't have to do nothing but play, pay it. And the uh, people flew in, family flew in, and um, the wedding. Yeah, I have the book in my room there. She made a nice book of her pictures, but exactly 120 days. What's the courtship like for a pastor? I know a lot of people would like to know, you know, yeah. when you grew up in the Baptist church and the church is avoid the, the, avoid the, the <laughs> lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh. Well, and, uh, yeah, you know, yeah, you, well, so it's a, pres- it's a pressure to jump into a, well, jump be, into a marriage. Yeah, well, here's the thing. Because we're older now, we have a family. Myself, I, and, and what I mean by that, I'm I wasn't wasn't no you know not into no game plan. I knew this was the one. I knew it, and so my point then was to get to know her. And I uh, went and done it the right way. I went to meet her. Her, her parents were alive, but her pastor, who was her uncle. She was staying with him. So I went to meet him and the wife to speak with him and and uh, went to his house, dressed up and, and uh, you know, wanted to let him know my intentions. And so I pulled up and and she was supposed to come out and greet me to introduce me to him. And she apparently didn't come out fast enough. So I just pulled up, got out. He was already outside. And I said, oh, okay. I said, God bless you. Um, I'm Brother Parker. You know, I'm here to, you know, you know, see Cynthia and to talk to you. So he looks at me and says, well, let's go over here and talk. So we go on the, <laughs> over on this little deck they had, right? And mind you, this is COVID, so they wasn't having people in their house. And, you know, they were very things, weary about that. So we're on the deck. So he says, everything was going good. And here you come along. <laughs> <laughs> I started laughing. I started laughing. <laughs> and we were standing up at first, and, and I had to back up. I said, whoa. <laughs> I said, what's going on with this? Huh? Yeah, but it, but it all it all turned out. He says, well, I want to know what your intentions are. I said, my intentions are honorable. I just want to get to know your niece, and we'll see what happens from there. You Where know? was she at this time? Would she look, was sitting down over there in the first, his look, wife. Look, looking nervous. Yeah, yeah, looking nervous, <laughs> sitting down, because she... No, she didn't know what he was going to say. And then she didn't know what I was going to say. And But I kept my composure and just rolled with it. So courtship, back to courtship. courtship I, as I tell even anyone getting married, get to know the person. Find out as much as you can. That means if you, the more time you spend with them in the sense of getting to know them, the better. Because what you wanted, because when you marry a person, you're marrying them for life. I don't believe and marrying one person one year, throw that person away and marry someone else. No, this is for till death do we part. So what you have to do is get to know them, get to know their background, get to know, you know, how they feel. You know, especially I'm a pastor. Do you, you know you you're, you're willing to know this is my calling, and will they be able to understand that? You know, um, and so it makes it good when they're part of the same church body which she was because they kind of understand she grew up church of god and christ um, so they under, they understand church dynamics but that's the main thing when you court people get to know them and um there's no i don't believe in waiting why i mean what's the point waiting two years right uh, you know dating someone two years no you're setting yourself up you know uh, if you love the person is, is it going to make it then then why wait that was my attitude. Well, the, the other thing, in all fairness, um, like you said, you're older, more established. Yeah, more established. Both yeah. you have families. You know, we yeah. live. You know, we live in a generation of ninety day fiance, and right, right? Married at first sight. And right, right. So, for some, you know, what would you say to your your younger colleagues, maybe pastors that are maybe twenties or yeah, 30s? The, yeah, the younger what, group. What kind I of tell them, yeah, my advice to them: they really 
take their time in the sense of knowing the person, pray. First of all, pray. Ask the Lord, is this your will? And then marry the person for the right reasons. See, some people don't even marry for the right reasons. What I mean by that, you marry them because you love them. This is the person that you want to spend the rest of your life with. Don't marry them just, oh, she looks so fine, or oh, maybe she. you think she has this or has it. No, that you, you marry a person because you love them, and you're going to spend the rest of life with them, and you're going to build a future with them. Was it Isaac and Jacob that Pray for a wife, and of course we know the story yeah, of Ruth story, and Boaz. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you would recommend just, but the, the dating process. I'm saying, what kind yeah. of recommendations would you make on? Yeah. You know, trying to, because it's a lot of pressure. I mean, yeah. um, you have to maintain yourself in the sense of being prayed and know that if this is the person you're going to be with, then keep it. If this is the person you want to marry then keep it honorable. Keep it in the sense of respect. And when the when the feelings get so strong where neither one of you can contain yourself, then you need to get married. Right. You know? Paul, and, huh? Yeah, you need to get married. Rather to marry than to yeah, burn. Yeah, you have to. Um, otherwise, you're just deceiving yourself. And you're and it goes back to, you know, why, why are you together with a person, you know? What about counseling? You recommend oh, that yeah. type before, of... Yeah, you got to have to have counseling. Before I marry people, I at least have three sessions just to find out but how their chemistry is. What about is. yourself as a senior pastor and all that? Did you have to speak with someone? Or? Well, I ran it by... Of course, I talked to people. My father, who's yet living, and I have, um, you know, a, a Bishop Macklin, who I count as a... As a my, he's my leader. When I can, so, yeah, you talk to people... And you're talking to them too about um, some, you know, have, have, do they know, you find out, do they know them? Do they know their family as well? And get their advice. And, and so the counsel that I get, most everyone that I did talk to, they, first of all, they, they, know, they knew my wife. They knew how great a person she was. Not only that, but they also, they know who I, I am. And like, we said earlier, why there's no sense of because you're older now. There's no sense of, you know, as I say, waiting to to do this long year courtship and all of that. Huh? Yeah, it's yeah, two or three years. No, mm -hmm. you don't need that because you have too much work to do. You know, so um, it's time to to go to work and and uh, if this is the person you know with as you pray is the one you're going to be with then be with that person i don't believe see what the problem is with these other people they they think this is the right one right but then all of a sudden oh this person's giving me the eye then you see you're not ready right right see because when you when you love the person this is the one you're going to be i don't care how many people come and give you the eye no your 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 mind's not on that you and you let them know, listen i'm engaged i'm not available yeah, yeah. i'm 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 not available with all due respect I'm so not was ready. it an engagement with you or did you oh yeah we did a, we did a, the full engagement i gave her an engagement ring and um, got down on one knees and proposed to her, and the whole the whole nine yards. How, lo how long was the engagement? Oh well, not long because we're talking about we got married in in 120 days, so it it went fast from the time we met in February. Then the engagement happened around February, March, April. Yeah, April, and then we got married in June. And the June was just because you know we had we set the date and give people time because we got. We got married in Vegas. You know, you have to give people notice so they can get their tickets, get their rooms, and you know, get Hotels prepared. Hotels and, yeah. and everything. And else. then she, she, she was a great planner on the whole wedding itself, the whole setup, and uh, the room where she, you know, she had her hotel, her room at the place, and then I was at the pyramid, and it was just, it was just great. You so know? you, you were at separate hotels. Oh yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Until after the until after the wedding, <laughs> well, we flew in. See, the wedding was on. But, but see, that's good advice. I mean, that's that's something oh, yeah. to to let somebody know. Yeah, yeah. You don't Just, stay in the whole same room. You're you're setting right. yourself up for 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 you know you're gonna get yourself in trouble. You won't be able to contain yourself. Right. So it's. I think the wedding was on. Oh, I want to say Saturday. Yeah, it was on a Saturday. Yeah, it was Saturday. So, yeah, it was on Saturday. We flew in. We got in town 
on Thursday. Okay. And so she went to her hotel. I stayed in my hotel. All right. Of course, we, we, we were together during the day, but at night she went home. Her way, you went your way. Okay. And then again, her friends came to help, you know, get her ready, you know, to she had a, a makeup person, a hair person. Yeah, I saw the pictures. They yeah, were, they, yeah. They, they were beautiful. Yeah, I, so she. I her, was shocked because I hadn't talked to you. I didn't yeah. even really know you would get married. Right, and right. I, and so, you, you sent me the pictures. I was like, yeah, yeah, this, what, yeah, this? yeah, yeah. And so <laughs> I wasn't we, invited. Yeah, I mean, so was, we got married on that Saturday, and then Sunday we flew out, or did we? No, Monday we flew out to Hawaii for our honeymoon. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So married on Saturday, then Sunday we were, and then we flew out early Monday, and we were in Hawaii for a week. So you had somebody cover service and everything. Yeah, I had someone mm-hmm. cover service, and so, yeah, man, it was it was awesome though. So you have the blended family now. So at what point do you talk to your family about her, and at what oh, point yeah. does she talk you to her family about well, you? Because yeah. you have, she has children, right? So one daughter. And, okay, and so, I have four. So then you have to do those introductions. Well, and yeah. How and, does that work? And because the daughter knew my son Joshua, I mean that was good. But she introduced her to me early on, and of course I introduced her to my kids. And remember, I, my kids was living with me, and it was really tough for them, you know, because all they knew was dad, and they. All they they never seen me with no one else, right? So it was tough. And then their idea was they wanted us all to live together. <laughs> <laughs> so we went out to dinner after church and said this. So you know, and the first thing Prince is us. Well, how do you feel about living with us? And she just like. <laughs> She just clapped up, huh? No, she, she just looked like, no, you know, because she didn't want to come right out and say it, but no, she's not living with us, right? So, we're good. Right. so well, I had to break that down to, to princess, and, and yeah, they took it really hard because they had it planned that the plan was, you it's know, gonna be, like, it was going to be the Brady Bunch. Well, right? that we, that, well, her daughter was, had her own place, and I, and I, my kids lived with me. So the plan was we buy a home. And we live together. Then as each child, you know, parts off, either gets married or, or, or buys their own house, that's how we, you know, we, we, we go. But I had to break it to him. I said, no, we're not going to live together. You know, Cynthia and I are going to have our own place. You know, which which was, we did. You know, so and these these are grown children. These are so grown children is- too, but they they took it so hard. But they they, they at, you know, at first I and I understood. I didn't I didn't argue with them or get scream at them. But I, I didn't even think they were, they wasn't even going to come to the wedding. Right. Yeah. So, I, so they took it. They oh, took yeah, it. they took it. So they were their so feelings. Say, huh? Yeah. So I had to say, okay, I understand. If you don't come to the wedding, you don't have to come to the wedding. But they, but they did. Jeffrey and and Princess came. My other two younger ones didn't. But but they like they 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 love Cynthia. They came. It was just when we had our family meeting. They just wanted me to know that it's nothing against. It was nothing against Cynthia. It's just that it was just very hard for them. To see me with someone else, would they never saw that because all they saw me was, was their with, mother. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so that so, that part was hard. Yeah, too. that was hard. So that was tough. For but me. but you know, as time went on, all that just you know worked itself out. You know, kind of dissipated. Yeah. So that was kind of the the appetizer. We hadn't even planned on 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 that. Yeah. But like I say, it's been a while since we had spoken with. So what's going on with the ministry? You 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 say that well, um, she is my wife has just been a jewel for ministry. Um, the, I mean, she's a tech person. She comes from the tech industry. She worked for big tech companies, CashNet, and all. So she her background is tech, which was just totally not my field. So I love. She's a tech person. You know, she where, you know. Uh, you know, I'm always, well, hey, let's fix this. No, but she's a problem solver. But she, the Lord gave her uh, to utilize this, our, our church here is massive. And she came up with the whole plan of rentmyhugechurch.com. That and was that was her concept. That was her whole, whole concept. Okay. She developed it and, and she con- made the context for pure space and then 
it just blossomed. She had a goal when she first started to bring in, say, her goal was three thousand dollars. Well, she surpassed that within within two weeks. So explain explain that concept to those who. Oh yeah. I mean, you and I have talked yeah, about rent, it. Yeah, rentmyhugechurch.com is where we, our our church facility is. We're able to rent it out for weddings. Uh, funerals, repasses, birthdays. Um, we early on we were booked every week about kinsays. Kin, you know, a lot of the groups did that. I uh-huh. mean, so, mm-hmm. um, so any type of you know those type of functions, we're, we we have the space to accommodate. We have a, right. a social hall. We have overflow rooms. So we have the space. We have the kitchens and everything. We have the everything. kitchen and everything. And all so, remodeled. I have yeah, to everything's say. remodeled. All the bathrooms remodeled. The rooms remodeled. The floors. Everything has been done except the last piece. We're going to finish it off, and that's the sanctuary. Okay. Of remodeling the sanctuary. But and everything the, else is Sound done. system, too. I have sound to system, um, screens. Mm-hmm. And so our last phase is now the sanctuary. But the balcony, we went through every single room of this church, cleared it out. You we're talking about this building was built in 1940. Church of All Faiths bought it in 1966. So it just had accumulated so much debris when I got here that I, I my and first how long action have you, was... How long have you been here? Again? I've been here since 2013. Okay. So when I first got here, we, were, we did massive, you know, some cleaned out, but not until... Like 2019, 2020, we went room by room, not only clearing it out, but remodeling every room as we went. But okay. they just had all type of debris. An old pipe organ was sitting right in the middle of the of the room at one point. So for whatever reason, they never moved it out. And it didn't even work. So um, Yeah, they usually don't. <laughs> yeah, so we just, uh, the Lord blessed us to remodel the whole thing. We got grants now that... We have brand new lights and cameras all on the outside now. Even the tower is lit up. You'll be able to see it tonight. And uh, so our last phase well, is, is our sanctuary. And we do have some grant money to get new doors, uh, new windows if need be. And, it, and, the, and the money is there to, to finish doing what we need to do. So tell me about the Rent My Huge Church. That's correct. Um, yeah. Rent my, been, huge, yeah. rent my huge church. Have you been approached by anybody and you say, well, this is a church, so we don't do that? Oh, yeah, 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 she mm-hmm. did. We were approached by a group. They wanted to come in and and have, I forgot what they called it, but it entailed actually just smoking weed in, this, <laughs> in, in some other part. No, we said, no, we don't allow that. We're not doing that. Um, so there are cases where, yeah, we turn, yeah, we vet whatever we vet yeah I was we gonna, vet was, them out before they come we question. just don't let anyone we have to vet them out to see what they're they're going to do what type of activity it is we just, we can't allow anything goes this is still the house of the lord so but rent my huge church was a way to give back to the community to say yes we are a church but we have a facility here we want to help you meet your needs. So if you have a birthday party, if you have, uh, you need a place for a reception or a wedding or even a funeral service, we, we have that available. So how do, you, how do you accommodate parking? I know this is, I yeah. mean, yeah. California period is bad for parking, but how do you accommodate parking with a facility this large? Oh yeah, well, d- d- that's a great question. Well, for the for the most part, the groups that do their party, like birthday parties or receptions, they they have they find parking around the church and around the, the the area, the park. Now there, but for groups such as, I'll give you an example. We had a school district, the American Indian School District, used our uh facility for one week okay so what we did the parking on that we partnered with uh down the street where walgreens is they allowed us and and lucky's over there yeah where, where walgreens they allowed the, the them to park there and we had a van that would pick them up and bring them so we we, we kind of shuttle system. yeah we had a shuttle system okay and we we can do that for large events Okay. We 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 can um, 
we can uh, shuttle them from the parking lots either at Walgreens, Lucky's, or even if push comes to shove, up the street is uh, Oakland High School. If it's a major event, they could park there and we shuttle them. So we're still being creative with the parking. So is that something that the church provides or is that something that's paid for? It's paid through the rentmyhugechurch.com. Yeah. Okay. But Those I'm, saying, I'm yeah. saying do you guys have uh, vans or do you have to rent no, vans? No, no, we rent the van out. Okay. We rent the van out. And yeah. then you use that for the... We use that for the for shuttle. And okay. it worked out just fine. Okay. Was that the first lady's idea? Was that yes, something you... Yes, that was the first lady I get. Yeah, it was her idea. She's... Yeah, she's phenomenal. She's something else. Yeah, she's something else. She... She, the Lord really blessed her at that. And, and again, she, she comes from an, you know, administrative background. She's being a manager of a tech, you know, tech place. So she has that background mm -hmm. of working with people and just problem solving. You know, I always tell her she has like an engineer mind, you know, of problem solving. So she can problem solve. So when you come up with the next renovation, yeah. Uh, how do you go into that process with the sanctuary? Will you have to move to a different part of the church? No. Well, we we have the overflow, and if it's if it's too small there, we have the social hall. So we can always have church downstairs, and the social hall is big enough, or even here in our overflow until um, the uh, sanctuary is done. So we'll stay on site. We'll just move to another room until it's done, because it's going to take at least sixty days speaking with the contractors because they have to redo the floors, take out all the pews. They're going to paint. We're getting a brand new ceiling, paint the whole. And then right now I'm just trying to determine um, either to keep those seatings or get brand new ones, the cushion ones, and a little bit wider. There are some that says, oh, keep it because they're historical. But then there's another side of myself that's saying, well, no, let's modernize and get the theater seats that are cushioned. And comfortable, and right. And comfortable and maybe a little bit wider, too. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm, I'm wrestling with right now. But, yeah, um, those that are there, they're, yeah, they are. Those pews been there since the church was built in 1940. So it does keep the historical look. Because if you look at the church, those beams, are, you know, we don't want, we'll, we won't mess with those. Those are all historical. But on the other side, we we can modernize the seating. Right. Yeah. So a couple of things. Um, I don't think we've had one of these conversations. It was pre-COVID. And I know at that time, a lot of people were closing and you did not close. You felt like the church was the first oh, responder. Yeah. Also, you've been growing um, by leaps and bounds when a lot of ministries have been stagnant or not. So talk about those two things, the process that you continued yeah. through COVID and secondly, right. uh, how you've been able to grow post-COVID yeah. and, and come back and come back stronger. Yeah, COVID hit us, well, when it says hit the church culture, really, they just shook us up, you know, because the churches had shut down and um, you had to change the way the ministries, everybody was going to Zoom and and and, and I don't fault them. And, and then, you know, you hear people, oh, I have more members now than I had before. They're all on Zoom. Okay, fine. I'm not knocking you. If that's the way, you know, the Lord bless you and that's the way, you, way it is, that's fine. I'm not against any of that. Personally, myself, I didn't shut down because... Um, I felt the church is an essential, was essential institution such as a hospital. Right. First, I, I felt first we, I felt we were, we were first responders. We're as important as the police department, the fire department, and the hospital. That was my my rationale number one. Uh, that um, second, I was I, I I was not, you know, so. Uh, unaware of the COVID that we had to, we yet took the necessary safety precautions with face masks, washing the hands, you know, doing a little spacing. But I, I wasn't going to shut down when I saw the governor running around Napa and having cheese and wine and want us to shut down. And he's running around doing, his events, doing whatever he wants to do. Fundraisers but, but, but he and wants fun. the churches to shut down. And, right. and that, that bothered me. I said, no. I'm not shutting down. I'd rather see you in court than shut down. And it's a shame that they're, they're, they're doing that church in San Jose. 
saying they have to give $2 million. No, there is a difference. There's a separation between church and state. And see, once you let the state cross that line to tell the churches what to do, we're in trouble. Right. Because the next thing they're going to do, oh, you got to shut down. Then what happens? They tell you, oh, we want we, we don't want you to say certain things. We don't want mm-hmm. you to preach certain things. We don't want you to be open for a certain time. Right. Or you're too loud. No, there's a there is a separation between church and state. The founders of this country set it up that way for the for the for the the state not to interfere in religious matters. How did what was your attendance like during COVID? Is it we maintained the same. It didn't some some dropped it did drop a little but it, per, for the most part it remained the same. And you got to remember at that time these were members who um were stable who was you know who who was coming to church anyway. In other words, these were the faithful, I would say faithful few, or they were coming anyway. And because we took the safety measures, such as the face masks, the washing of hands, to make sure we we had a sprayer that would spray the church every Saturday, and, you know, for COVID. So we took those safety measures, and I think that made people feel comfortable. And because our church was so... Is so you know our sanctuary is big enough. We were able to space out people. Right. You so have, they wasn't you have a all. Yeah, they wasn't all just up on each other. Now though, because we're growing, we of course we couldn't do space out because we're growing at a at a, a reasonable pace, and the Lord is blessing us with with people in. You know this is post COVID, but the Lord is just sending people in, and we're and we're witnessing, and and uh, people are catching on, and they're catching on because. Um, they, they when they come in, they feel it is a, a church of love. Right. I remember the original numbers. I guess you say you came in 2013 when we would visit. Yeah. It would be the seniors. Yeah, the and, seniors. And how, how many yeah. would you say? Would it be 15 to 30? Or like, I think it was about 30, of, no more than 35 at that time. Okay, so at what point, you say your number's up around well, about yeah, 150 yeah, now or more? Well, our or? numbers during that 2013 now, Again, my wife was doing the feeding program every Friday. So and and number, this is uh, Sister Princess. Yes, Sister Princess, my first year. And our numbers jumped up because we were doing you know, some things in the community. But up to that point, I think the highest we had got, we were around maybe the 45, 50 mark at the most. Okay. And then, then you know, you'd have sporadic growth. Some come, some don't, whichever church you have that. Now our growth is more than that because I have I have help I have a pastoral team you know which is good but also we've just been witnessing I've been we've been energizing the the saints to uh, be friendly to people be kind to people and invite your family invite your friends invite your your neighbors which I've done myself and and then people have just been coming. And we don't put pressure on people that you have to join. We just want them to come, enjoy the Lord. We have some good singing, uh, good music. Uh, hopefully, the Lord keep blessing, good preaching. And then at the end of the day, we want them to give their life to Jesus. So when did you see a change or influx when you yeah, well, started to get the... Well, we've been, I've always been doing follow-up. But the, but the change has been coming because we... Not only every month we 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 have a big dinner for everyone, um, and people enjoyed that. They enjoyed the friendliness. So we're in 2023. There was a change after I got married. Um, so we want to say end of 2021, beginning okay. of 2022. Mm-hmm. And what was we, the, we just what start, happened? We just start seeing the momentum coming, where you'd have people come. They enjoyed it. And then I was another thing I was able to um, have consistency with the music, you know, organists, drums, you know, we start adding. And I think really people enjoy the fact that we we beautified God's house. We, we, we keep it, you know, we keep God's house at the forefront. So even the neighbors seen the, the remodel and we painted the whole outside. So they've seen the work that's been done. And then the ones who've been coming members, they've been energized 
because they, they see where all their money's going. Was it any type of advertisement or outreach or door to door or no, no. anything it like that? It was just organically where, the, well, over, it was just a, a call for our own members to invite their loved ones, invite their friends. And that's what's caught on. And then by having our monthly dinner, that we would have a catered dinner every month. People like that, and then and then they. So just, you you do that every month. Every month we have dinner. Uh, Is that first Sunday, fourth, fourth, fourth Sunday? Sunday by the fourth Sunday? Okay, but fourth. It so happened this last month we had it every every week. People, you know, they, they we had a committee that just for they just got excited and did a for for the Easter Sunday they did a big dinner. And then they were just so excited for that. They did it again after it. So um, I was here a few months ago. I wasn't able to. I had a function in San Francisco. That was yeah. your birthday, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, I, yeah. I stopped by for. Oh, yeah. For, that was downstairs in the social hall. Yeah, I stopped by for a yeah, few yeah. minutes, but I had to head off to San Francisco. Yeah, we had a good. Yeah, we had those. Are like good. Those were a lot of our members. That was our members there for that, too. So what happened with you went from the. Um, you went from those fellowships, and then I saw you had a, a pastoral staff that came in, but you also say you, oh, yeah, you got well, a, another church. Yeah, did, well, did you merge with the church? Yeah, yeah well, what happened? Um, uh, Pastor Arthur Powell and Sophia Powell, who are also um, our residents here, we have a, a, a two-bedroom uh, apartment that they rent out. Well, they, have, they also were renting out a space in our church for their own church at, at called um uh, what was the name of the church life grace life grace life and um they had about maybe 10 to 15 members okay but the lord spoke to they seen what we were doing okay and the lord spoke to them and says you need to be with pastor parker and i knew knew it before they even told me and I shared with my wife, but my wife didn't want me to say anything, and I didn't because you know we, we that, you know that's a touchy situation. You want to tell someone, hey, just join in. No, we had the Lord do it. Yeah, and, let and, them. And, yeah, yeah, and they came, mm -hmm. and the Lord had told them, and and that has been a blessing. And they had about ten or fifteen. Yeah, and they brought theirs. And their so ministry. now they serve on your ministerial yeah, ministerial yeah, pastoral, team. Yeah, as well? team. Okay. And we're all here together as one. You know, and you have a full min. You you have a full um, music department yeah we'll have a director of the media gentleman that handles the screens the mics the sound we have a, a minister of music named brother benton smith who handles the music and choir and then we on sunday we have um some great singers that come in not every sunday but they love being here um you know alfreda lyon she's here with us okay and so others have just come you know they're just coming and uh, and that just helps add on to the Do trip. you have Zoom or live streaming or Facebook Live? Yeah, Instagram? Facebook Live. Okay. It's Facebook Live. So you, you have Facebook yeah, Live? Yeah, it's Facebook Live. Every Sunday it's on Facebook Live. Okay, every and, Sunday? Yeah. And that can, that continues to grow? That continues to grow, yeah. I don't know. My wife handles that. I don't know much about Facebook because I'm not on Facebook, but they stream at Facebook Live every Sunday. So what happens next with um you were telling me about your name or something like that? Yes, we uh, we have a new name for the church. The Lord gave me, it's called Unity of the Faith Cathedral. Right now, we're the Church of All Faith. Um, but Is it faith, faith with an S on with it? With an S on it. Okay, and so, faith. So yeah, faith. and you have to explain that because when you, um, people will take, some will take it as, well, faiths, that means any faith, Muslims, uh, Buddhists, whatever. Hindu, Jew, Hindu, yeah, whatever. well, okay, but when it says Church of All Faiths, it pertains to the Christian faith. So whether you're Methodist, Baptist, Pentecostal, all who ascribe to Jesus Christ as Lord, the Christian faith, mostly denominational, yeah, yeah, whether you're um, Presbyterian, Lutheran, Methodist, you know, all of those Christian faiths, that's what it was re referenced to. And this was given by Howard Thurman, the Church of All People, when it started in San Francisco. He was trying to create a church for everyone across racial grounds. And so when the Church of All Faith began, they had a disdain for bishops because they broke away from Bibi because uh, they were uh, at Bibi, 
the bishop came in and removed the pastor, okay, who was Pastor it. Thomas, mm -hmm. and that created a stain. So the, there's a group who said, he's doing well, why move him? So they stayed with him, and they broke away and started the Church of All Faiths. And then they started at Mosswood Park. They went somewhere else. And in 1966, when there was a white flight of this area, um, they were able to purchase this building. So white flight, all the whites moved when the they, black they moved people up came in the hills. In. Yeah, they moved out of this area, and moved up in the hills. And so the new name, explain the new name. Yeah, the new name, Unity of the Faith Cathedral. Lord gave that to me from Ephesians four and thirteen. It best describes what we're doing here as as a church. When you when you read that. Book of Ephesians, the prior verses talk about he gave some pastors, some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some teachers, all for the perfecting of the saints. And then when you get to the 13th verse, it says, till we all come in the unity of the faith. So what that means, it really pertains to the original intent of the founders here, because it's really just bringing us all together as one bringing us into unity. Right. And, there, and there's unity so much the division, faith. you know, and we have too much division in the body of Christ. We need unity. We need to be unified. And if, and if you're not united, uh, you're, 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 you're going to fall. And what about the uh, youth department at your church? Have you been bringing in any? Well, we have youth and we, we, right now we, we've spontaneously been growing. So in the upcoming months, we're going to have a more, concrete or synchronized appointments of these positions. Right now, we had a big East, uh, during Easter, we gave out 100, I mean, 100, 40, over 45 Easter baskets. Okay. On, okay. On, to, the, to the young kids. And so we want to capture them. And uh, then they had an Easter egg hunt on that day throughout the church. It wasn't even outside. They had an Easter egg hunt in the church. So you have quite a few youth. Yeah, they, they, that that come. We're working on it, mm -hmm. but we, we have they, they they were there that day. We're still working on them some more. So we're gonna have a whole youth department, and they've already making plans for barbecues and things like that. So the youth is something we really have to keep praying uh, to reach. You know, we're reaching other people, but even our young people who may have been I don't know what generation they call this now. I don't know if it's X or Z or whatever. But we, we have to pray to reach them because they're so exposed to so much and they have so much options out there. So you have a lot who don't believe that haven't even been to church before. Right, so many choices. Yeah, church, but they don't even believe that they have to come to church. They don't believe that, that Jesus is even important. So this is our battle. Right, and speaking of Easter, um, did you were you able to see or hear about the Easter production at Transformation Church, Mike Todd, Pastor Mike Todd. No, I didn't hear about that. Bro. Yeah, in Tulsa. So I'll, I'll have to show you a clip from oh, it. It okay. was, was kind of maybe BT Awards wow. slash Girls Gone Wild slash I don't know what else to throw in there. It was... Uh, this is what happened at their church? Yeah. It, wow. Pastor Mike Todd, which is in um, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Transformation. Yeah, Church. I heard of Transformation Church. So if you Google it, if you go to YouTube, I mean, it's it's all over YouTube. It was a, you know, they had secular music and they had some a little Beyonce here and a little Kesha here and all nerd service. Uh, and they had a woman on the cross and it was a lot of mixed messages. So it's a lot going on about um, kind of blending in. Or conforming to be, you know, to to yeah. attract to attract well, the, see, the younger crowds. Well, that's where I differ. Well, that's where I, differ. I don't. I, I preach the gospel, and I just I'm just one who've always been uh, a very uh, prudent that you don't need any gimmicks or tricks for the gospel. All you need is the word. Right. It's been a big yeah. back. It's been a big backlash, and yeah. and, and you know, of course. Uh, we just lost uh, uh, Pastor Charles, Doctor Charles Stanley, which was, yeah, yeah, he's, you know, who was one of the yeah, he was great. one of the fathers of the church, and especially in terms of being a solid teacher. So. Right. So we appreciate it, and it's, yeah. it's it's been awesome. Anything else you want to share with us? Well, we just want to share that 
the church exists for not just ourselves, but we must impact our city and our community in our city. And our city here of Oakland is in trouble. And, and, you know, it's just the political uh, structure, is you know, the spiritual structure. We need a revival. But also we need not just a revival. We need uh, rel- pastors I'm speaking to uh, to call out our oppressors. And I think what happens, we get so embedded in the system we don't want to preach the gospel. We don't want to call them out because we're so afraid of what we may lose. Oh, we may lose out on this money or we may not get the state money. Listen, God doesn't need that money. God has what we need, but we're not going to sell out and dumb down to make other people feel good. No, we're going to preach the gospel in love, but we got to call these oppressors out from the city mayor all the way to the police department and anyone else and any other pastor. If you're not, uh, if you want to sell out, sell out. We're not going to sell out. And what I mean by sell out, we're going to preach the gospel in love, but we're not, we don't have no gimmicks or tricks to get people in. No, we offer them Jesus. And, and I don't believe you have to have some type of, 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 of thing, you know, some special gimmick to get young people in or our our seniors in. We just need to love people, you know, and we love Mm -hmm. them. Absolutely. And love them and and feed them, they'll come. We have a new uh Mary and I know you had reached out to Libby Shaft during COVID and you offered the church. The new mayor came to the church and spoke. And uh I heard I enjoyed what she said. I haven't been able to reach her since she's been in office. But she came here to the church and spoke. And, was was and, that doing service or was that doing? Uh, uh, when no, you, no, she had a, a what, like rent, a, rent out your church. Thing? No, no, she just had a. Uh, they brought her for a press conference slash, um, you know, campaign route. She came here yeah. at your church at the church, but it, but it, it was wasn't. In the, it was in the right in the overflow. But room. it wasn't doing service. It wasn't doing service. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, but she did speak and had a press conference and a rally here. And, you know, we heard her voice and, and I even said to her then, I said, I don't want someone we're going to see every four years and don't just say, give us what you think we want to hear so you can be in office. Right. And I even told her then that I, 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 I hear what you're saying. You're saying the right thing. But if you become the mayor, don't think I'm not going to call you out just because you came to my church. I'm going to call you out. I'm going to call you out on these ch- these potholes need to clean up the city. The city's dirty. And the, the crime, the, the, the crime, the, the windows, dirt. the windows yeah, and the cars. Just, yes, yes, yeah, dirty. The crime. And, and, you know, she needs to do her job. Clean this city up. The city looks horrible. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the debris in the city looks horrible. The potholes are horrible. The crime is horrible. I'm not blaming her for everything because her predecessors didn't leave her with much. But now that you're in office, don't don't hide behind your uh, your your office chair or desk and just think you can do whatever you want to do now that you're in office. Right. Every time I've seen her, she's had that same backdrop in that chair. And I know that. So we'll see what she comes yeah, up yeah, with. Yeah. And I, I will call her and someone says she's supposed to come by. But whether she does or not, I'm going to call her out like I call Libby Schaff out. Clean up this city. And I know she got in. She fired the police chief, whatever that was about. But we need the crime to stop. But we need stability in the police department he needs stability right he was speaking with the churches and trying to build it up i really didn't understand that move but yeah that's what they do sometimes when you get a new person in office yeah yeah so well we'll see what she's gonna do i haven't seen nothing yet but maybe i haven't kept up with it enough but i'm i'm am keeping it up that uh, we want to hear from her and not these sound bites we want action that's going to help our city, help our communities, and clean this city up. So we appreciate you. It's been great. We have to yeah. catch up. And we thank you so much for dropping by. Yes. And we love having you always. And what would you like to close out with us on? i like to close out to everyone who feels like giving up or 
feels as if it's over, it's not over. And I want to put in your spirit, your future is much brighter than your past. But yes. you must, your future is much brighter than your past. You're, it's not over in your life. God yet has a plan for you. And uh, just want to encourage everyone to keep on keeping on. God bless to you and your family. God bless you. Thank you as always. Thank you. Thank you. Remember everybody in all of your getting, get understanding. Yes. Thank you. And thank thank you you for this interview. Thank you for your expertise, Brother Keith. We love you. We appreciate you, your talents. We've been friends for many years and we just appreciate your service to humanity. Thank you. Thank you. And God bless you until next time. Until next time.